Hey there, welcome, um, welcome to the session. We've got, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about investigating China, how to report on China in 2021, a, a, a subject I spend a lot of time, um, well, grappling with as I try to report on China from Beijing and then Sydney and now in Taipei, where I'm coming, coming to today. We've got a, a, a super panel along with me. Oh, I should say, I'm, I'm Will Glasgow from the Australian, um, the North Asia correspondent based in Taipei. Um, we've got an amazing panel um, today, just the people you'd want to ask this question to. Um, we've got Jin Yang from the Wall Street Journal, uh, who's based in Hong Kong. We've got David Barbosa, uh, the founder of The Wire, who's coming in from, uh, from New York. And we've got uh, Bao Choi coming in from Harvard, where she's, she's at the moment. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Couldn't think of three better people to talk about this with. And um, I'm going to learn a lot on this. And hopefully all of you guys listening along as well will, um, will, will as well. So look, first up, um, Bao. Hi. How do we report? <laughs> Take it away. Hi. Um, thanks for having me tonight first. Um, I will introduce a bit of myself first. I have been working as a journalist in Hong Kong for more than a decade and with a focus on investigative journalism in recent years. Um, so I always see Hong Kong as the best window to report on China as we are re relatively from, free from the constraints placed on journalism next door in China. Um, one of the advantages here in Hong Kong was the free flow of information and the accessibility of a lot of public data. So as journalists in Hong Kong, we really relied a lot on those tools to investigate um, issues in Hong Kong and also in China. And that is especially important and useful for those access to the public data because a lot of Chinese enterprise and also political exposed people, they will have their footprints in the city. Say when they register companies in Hong Kong, got married, gave birth to their children, purchased cars or properties, or even commit a crime in the city. In the past, journalists would be very easy to access to those data. Um, in the past, we were uh, quite free to uh, check those public data from different government departments. We could uh, access data such as birth and marriage records, directorship and annual reports of companies, um, ownerships of vehicles, transactions, details of properties. Um, this combinations of tools really allow us to cross check a lot of identity, families and business relations. Take the story of Petra Ko, who was the former minister in the government, as an example. Um, he was arrested by the U.S. government in, by the U.S. government in 2018 for a cross-border corruption scheme, and um, he was arrested for uh, giving bribes to African country leaders for a Chinese energy enterprise. And in that case, I was able to use the information from the company registry to trace horse of some companies' activities in Hong Kong and so as his relations with some Chinese businessmen in the, business, uh, in the energy sector. An other example would be a mob attack happened in 2019 um, during the largest social movement in Hong Kong when 100 white clay men carrying weapons indiscriminately attack protesters and uh, citizens on the streets. I was able to search um, ownership of vehicles to trace who had transported those weapons and suspected attackers to the district. But the government had tightened up all those policy in the name of protecting privacy and preventing doxings in recent months. Um, birth and marriage workers were no longer available. Um, I was arrested a year ago for the investigation of the mob attack and find guilty of making false statements to obtain public data um, and records. Um, so my arrest and conviction become a precedent in Hong Kong and the India and Hong Kong had immediately stopped all uh, vehicle searches after my arrest. Um, right now I'm still appealing against my conviction and the government has already adopted more measures to restrain access to those public data in Hong Kong. Months ago, the city allowed company directors to conceal their identities by hiding some of their identification numbers and addresses. 
The Judiciary Department also deletes information such as identification numbers and address uh, of defendants. And a week ago, um, people who conduct company and then search nowadays had to disclose their names and ID numbers and acknowledge that our data may be transferred to the enforcement. We also have to sign a statement confirming the data obtained will not be used in violation of privacy. And I will see all these policies has created more legal risk for journalists who have to assess those data. So uh, to give a very short summary, I will say that becomes more and more difficult for journalists to use Hong Kong as one of the window to uh, investigate into um, the business in China or political sensitive peoples in, Hong, uh, in China. Um, and as journalists, we have to be very cautious in um, assessing those data and be aware of our risk um, in using the tools that are available in the public domain. Now, um, thanks, thanks for that. And gosh, your, I mean, your personal story, your arrest in November uh, last year was so shocking. Um, I remember reading that and just in the, in the aftermath of the national security law and with so much uncertainty about the application of that, but clear an intent to crack down on uh, Hong Kong's free press. Um, your example, your case, which isn't actually correct, I'm correct here, it's not part, it's not a national security law case, um, but it was part of that broader crackdown. Um, how, you know, that happened to you. Do you feel, do you have a handle on where the law is in Hong Kong? Do you feel you could go back to Hong Kong and report and, and, and have a sense of where the red lines are or, or are they moving too fast? Um, actually, today was the first anniversary of my arrest. I didn't aware that oh. this, until this morning. <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone um, a friend from Hong Kong remind me and he called me yeah. saying that to make sure I'm safe. <laughs> I'm, I, it's just a good joke. I mean, um, but that's true. I mean, um, it, the, the past year seems so quick because a lot of things happen in Hong Kong, especially like being a journalist in Hong Kong, you become more insecure. And I am so lucky that I'm not arrested by the national security law, uh, which we know that like there are already like five journalists from Apple Daily who have been arrested under the law and they were delayed mm -hmm. with their bail. And basically they were just um, put into custody without any public trial at the stage. Um, and when you ask the questions um, saying that uh, if I can back to Hong Kong as a journalist, I, I have to say that first, uh, I'm right now a Neiman Fellow at uh, studying at Harvard University for a year. So my plan is I will back to my city to um, continue be as a journalist and that's my plan and that's why I'm here. And, but that's true, I'm not sure because like, I, I'm not sure what will happen if I back to Hong Kong and if I continue to do investigative journalism. That's the, definitely the right questions. I, I, I will have no answer at this point because I have no idea where are the red lines. Um, journalists in Hong Kong nowadays are talking about we don't just have a wet line, we have a wet sea because you didn't know what topics can you cover or what areas um, would be sensitive or will be alleged as like colluding with uh, foreign powers or um, encouraging um, um, uh, or endangering national security. And uh, especially after a few um, national security cases has been put on court, uh, I understand that a lot of media has already like censor, censoring, like putting the slogan or they will cut um, any scenes that will um, show the slogans, which um, has, um, has um, uh, in, according to the court verdict is uh, endangering national security. So mm -hmm. nowadays media has to actively do their self censorship, I would say. Um, and especially on investigative journalism, um, I mean, Hong Kong is always a place to cover like corruptions, bribes, or um, business misconduct or frauds. I mean, related to Chinese business. So we never know whether that will, I mean, attribute like to national security. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I, I want to ask you so many more things about Hong Kong and your experience, but let's, I'm going to park them and we'll, we'll come back to this when we uh, open up to the panel and also people listening in if you've got some questions send them in too and i'll try to ask those at the end um okay uh let's go to david now dave mm, sure 
Great to be here with you. Um, so I'm Dave Barboza. I was covering China, I guess, for the last um, almost 20 years, uh, 12 of those years in, in Shanghai and for the New York Times, and now I'm at The Wire in Boston. Um, so it's, it's hard to follow up what Lao just said. Um, it is a terrible period uh, just before this sort of crackdown and restriction on journalists inside of mainland China and in Hong Kong. Um, I had been reporting in Shanghai and received for my own reporting death threats and all sorts of government harassment. Um, it got pretty bad just before I left in 2015, death threats also to my wife. And so I thought things got a little bit better just after I left and then they got worse again. So I don't wanna downplay how bad it is for journalists. Certainly the restrictions are remarkable. Um, a lot of people think the golden age of reporting from China is over, that people who were reporting in say 2004, when I got to China to about 2015 or 16, that it was a great period. And, and although there were restrictions, it wasn't anything like today. But I also wanna tell you what I think is, um, when you think about, yes, we're in dark days, the access is cut off in many ways, and there are threats to journalists like Bao Choi and even Jing Yang who are covering China. I think there's another story that we ought to think about in going forward, and that is, that in many ways, this is the golden age of covering China, not in that it is easy for journalists or even good and not dangerous, but that the story is so much more powerful, compelling, important in every way. And so to me, that means this is the best time to cover China, the most important time, even if there are these um, really harsh restrictions on journalists. Um, and I think, you know, we often uh, see in journalism, you have to change and adapt when the circumstances change. Bao Choi talked about the records in Hong Kong being locked up or being more uh, restricted these days. I use those records, I use records in mainland China and other places. But I think there's also, because China is now a global story, um, there are records all over the world about China. And I have spent the last two and a half years, or really almost four years, covering China from outside of China. And I think that's just gonna be the way it is um, for many journalists is, they're not gonna cover from inside mainland China, they're gonna cover from outside. And the story can still be covered from abroad. Um, you have documents, like I said, all over the world, corporate documents, there are more people following every development in China, from electric vehicles to you know, biotechnology, everything. So the sources may not wanna go on the record, but they're global. There's more interest in China than ever before because of all the talk about climate change and US-China relations and, and the rise of China in authoritarianism. So I think it's, it's actually gonna make it so that there's more interesting reporting. And that reporting should be more complex. If you ask me what it was like in the early days for me to cover China in the 2000s when China was just becoming, coming out onto the world stage, it was exciting, but it wasn't as interesting as it is right now. This is the most interesting period I've ever faced because the challenges are harder. The documents are more complex and the story is all over the map. So I think actually for investigative journalists or not investigative journalists, the challenge now is go out and find new ways to cover. If you think about how BuzzFeed covered China, the New York Times, ICIJ, documents, leaked documents, satellite imagery, drone imagery. Um, my favorite is kind of looking at corporate maps and, and corporate structures and trying to piece together money flows across borders. There is so much more than when I was starting out covering China. Um, I also think it challenges us to think about China in broader ways than when things are easier. So reporters should dig into 
all sorts of new sources and scholarship. The think tanks are releasing so many reports on China. The governments around the world are releasing so many reports almost every day. So we can take in all this. We can use original documents, use new technologies, and tell a more complex story. Um, even the story about the crackdown on journalists, that's part of the story that we cover. Um, so I think it is, there's no, there's no time that I would want to be more involved in the coverage. And so I would encourage all of those out there who are covering China, that no matter where you are, you can cover China from that country, from that place, from libraries, from inside, outside of China, Taipei, the New York Times, my colleagues are now in, in Korea covering China. So that's just the way it's gonna be. We adapt and we find inventive and innovative ways to do journalism. And um, people may not wanna talk on the record, but everyone wants to talk off the record. And you can figure out ways to use that to tell a deeper story. And, and, and that's what I, I'd like to do. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Hey, no, thank you, David. And I, I, it's so great to hear. I, I, speaking to you before the, before the conference and just hearing you again today, it's so wonderful to be told this is the golden age of uh, reporting on China. I, I must say, the amount of times I've felt as I'm reading um, books published over the last 10 years, oh, why wasn't I there then? You know, that was the time, that was the time. But as you say, you know, we shouldn't talk down this moment this is, as well. This is and, better. I mean, you know, wow, your career is so incredible. The reporting you did at the New York Times, absolutely sensational. I, I mean, why did you leave? Why did you? I, I mean, it's amazing to me that you, I mean, mm -hmm. you certainly back up your talk that this is the moment because you, Dave, have founded a China-focused or China-exclusive magazine. Mm -hmm. in this, it's why? Right. So... I loved my job at the Times. Um, I was in China for 12 of those years. And part of me when I left still wanted to cover China. And I also wanted to spend more time with documents. And so I like, like Bao Choi, I went to Harvard on a Neiman Fellowship. I looked into, is it, would it be possible to cover China from outside of China, say Hong Kong, kind of outside of China, or from the US using documents and translating those documents and getting deeper into the China coverage. Although the Times is amazing to report from, I wanted to cover it in all sorts of other features and work on getting data, data that could help tell different stories. And that would be hard to do inside the New York Times to just tell them like, I'm just gonna spend you know, years collecting data and then figuring out stories. So this was really an experiment to see, first at Harvard and now at The Wire, could we cover China, English language weekly, magazine-like, using data that we collect, that we organize, that we translate, and tell different stories from around the world? So stories about China and Africa, China and Europe, China in the US. Um, I wanted to do more Q and A's. I wanted to, lots of people I was interviewing, they would be cut out of my stories. And I thought, I wanna to talk to this person for an hour and just publish everything they say. So we can do that with the magazine. The restrictions on space in the New York Times mean lots of what work that I was doing. There was just not room for it. We had lots of China reporters and I wanted to, to sort of go longer, um, go a little deeper. And, and you know, today we have, I think, 10,000 or so words a week in the magazine. It would be hard for us to get that in the Times because there's so much other international news. So this is my opportunity to see, can I pull this off? Can I sort of develop a magazine about business, China, the world from outside? Well, look, I think you're, you're being very modest. I mean, I would say, I think you answered the question already since you've established. I, I think the why is sensational. And um, I, it, it's you. so cool that it was born or it was created 
before the mass expulsion of American journalists. It was already an idea. I really love that about it, that you're already thinking, oh, could we do this? It's so mm. prescient now. And I must say, it's, it brings a lot of hope to people I meet outside of China now who <laughs> are now wrestling with this question, left on their own or because they have to, because there's no choice. That's right. But to, so. That's right. By the way, you know, there are so many great China reporters who leave China and they still have so many China stories in them. So yeah. like John Pomfret, like, please come and write for us. Um, there are so many people. So there's actually life after being out of China as a correspondent, um, but you yeah. can still cover China. Um, we'll go to uh, Jin now, um, who does, works at the Wall Street Journal based in Hong Kong and just does mm -hmm. some, work with corporate records that blows my mind. I love your reporting. You get some, your, your scoop on Luckin, I remember reading in Beijing thinking, how the hell did she get this? So this is a great session for me because I can finally work out or ask you, how the hell did you do it? Hi, thanks Will. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, first, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I have in the past um, learned a lot from the tools and tips shared at JN conferences. So I'm very happy to be here today and uh, share a thing or two. Um, so I have been covering China for about a decade with a focus on business and financial news. Um, and um, I think, unlike, unlike David, and also to echo his points, um, the majority of that decade, I was based outside of China, based offshore. Um, and this is um, simply because of um, government restrictions that you know Chinese nationals are not allowed to um, work for foreign media in China um, as um, you know a reporter. So I, you know, in order to pursue my career as a journalist, I have to, um, you know, make other op it have, have to you know make other choices. And so, not to make it sound um, exaggerating or hyperbolic, but I think people like me we have basically been forced to live in exile um, if we want to pursue our career um, in covering China as journalists indep independently. Um, <clears throat> and then I would like to, you know, maybe start with sort of how, how difficult it has become. Um, I think, you know, um, even, if, even though I'm, you know, born and raised in China, to be based outside of China and covering the country I constantly have to remind myself to, to, to keep up with what's going on in the country to make sure that I know what is the, even the latest slants that, you know, keys today on news, um, and then to not be misled by my own assumption. Um, and then that has become uh, much more difficult in the last uh, 18 months or so um, since the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think um, you know, as you know, China still maintains a zero tolerance policy um, for COVID, and that this means that border restrictions are still very much in place. Um, and then that means um, a reduction of people-to-people -people exchange, um, civil level exchanges. And as a, as a result, we've seen a surge of misunderstandings and misinformation, um, both you know, from China looking to the world and the world looking back into China. And this means that I think, you know, our job as journalists covering China are, um, you know, more important yet more difficult than ever. Um, um, that said, um, I still find that um, with the proliferation of, you know, digital communication tools, like right now we're having this virtual conference, this would be unimaginable, I think two years ago. Um, I, I, I do um, um, find a uptick of people's comfort level in talking remotely. Um, and I have, there, there's been countless times in the past 18 months that I've done stories with people um, I've never met in person. Um, I found that it is possible to build um, that bond um, with your interviewees, with your sources um, um, uh, uh, digitally. Um, and, and let alone, you know, you know with, the, with the great tool of, of internet and technology, um, you know, there's a lot of information that we can um, we can get, um, even though we're not um, in the country uh, 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 physically. Uh, and to 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 echo that point, um, I'll just talk briefly about the Locking Coffee series stories that I did last year. 
Um, so I, um, I started digging into Lockheed Coffee, which by the way, was listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange uh, back then, and it was touted as the strongest rival um, to Starbucks in China. And um, the company, I think um, barely a year after its IPO, the company um, said that, you know, it has found that um, some of its um, sales records were uh, fabricated. But it stopped, but it didn't say anything beyond that. It didn't tell the public um, what exactly happened and who was responsible. So I started digging into um, this story that was April last year and at the beginning of the global pandemic, if you remember. Um, and then I think after some pain, painstaking weeks, um, you know, trying to find people to talk to and, you know, piecing through, I think, every single piece of record that I can find publicly, you know, in China and in other jurisdictions, I was able to, uh, to, to piece together how um, exactly the company's uh, management and executives uh, fabricated those cells and how the entire scheme um, was actually, um, can actually be traced back to the company's chairman and controlling shareholder at the time. Um, and then many of the findings in my reporting months later were echoed, uh, proved to be right um, in uh, uh, the in investigations led by um, um, China, uh, Chinese government and the US government um, respectively. And so um, I guess to sum up, what I want to say is that there is hope um, um, there are many stories that can be done, um, uh, even though you're not in China. Um, I'd be happy to talk uh, more about this um, in our um, discussions later. Yeah, oh, I thank you for another hopeful, sunny uh, presentation. That's good, that's good. We need that. Hey, now one thing I wanted to know with the Luckin story. So Luckin's NASDAQ listing, did it, how helpful was that? It, are you able to get more information uh, about a China-based company if it has or had an American listing, like in that example? So um, the short answer is not really. Um, actually, if you compare, and, and David will about feel free to jump in as well, if you compare the IPO prospectuses in both uh, you know, mainland China exchanges and US or Hong Kong exchanges, you will find actually the Chinese ones are much more detailed. Um, mm -hmm. There's simply a lot of things that um, the U.S. Um, under U.S. security laws, um, you know, a foreign issuer is not required to disclose. A foreign issuer, meaning you know, the issuer of the securities is not American, right? It's foreign. So, and that's the way that I think um, all of the Chinese companies uh, are categorized on, on U.S. stock market. Um, that said, um, I think. Um, although there's maybe not, you know, more information I can get on paper because uh, because of its NASDAQ listing. However, because of it's listed on a global stock exchange and it's traded by investors from around the world. So there is potentially a lot more people you can find to talk to. Um, that is definitely a benefit. Yeah, yeah I was going to... I was going to will to add to that and say, Please. yes, um, I do agree with Jing that the listings in, in China and for a while, even in Hong Kong, there was far more detail in, in those prospectuses and global offerings. Um, Hong Kong used to be very good. It's gotten worse and worse over the years as far as its disclosures. I mean, even I was just reading Evergrande's disclosures for offering for 2009 was not really that great. Um, but when a company lists in China, it's quite detailed. Um, I remember seeing Ping An list in 2007 in Shanghai and that prospectus was one of the best I've ever seen. Um, the Hong Kong one was also pretty good, but the, the Shanghai one was better. Um, and I also think she's right about when you're listed overseas, you might not have a better disclosure, but you will have so many global investors willing to dig in. And so they may be more likely to be your sources um, overseas than someone in China. It might be a little bit harder. So, um, but there's, it's, it's great to have different jurisdictions with different listings. Um, 
because you've got multiple, well, just more entry points, more people to talk to, more advisors and things. Is that right, Dan? That's right. I mean, there are now, yeah. I think there may be more Chinese um, listed companies inside China than there are American companies listed in the US markets. There are a lot. I mean, China only got its uh, stock market in about 1990, but it is amazing yeah. how many listed companies. And that doesn't include like the new third board and all these other, um, you know, kind of listed companies in China. So there's a lot of great information in those public company filings inside China still today. Unfortunately, for as as Bob Tree said, Hong Kong um, sadly is is it's very difficult now to get information out of Hong Kong. Yeah, so, I, I I'm just gonna add very quickly as a matter of fact, in the case of lobbying, I we want to when I was you know piecing together the scheme, I I did get help from actually some Chinese IPO prospectors. It's a it's a company funded by you know, uh, previously by Locking's funder. So, um, you know, they, you know, those were incredibly detailed and, and it's definitely worth checking out. And, and I mean, I, I would say the go-to places I would do when I start on, on a company would be, you know, mainland China, Hong Kong, still, um, Singapore, um, and then see if they have any Register, uh, you know, any entities registering like UK, Australia, and these are places that are quite easy to to access. Um, but those will be like the first places that I go check. So you're looking to see, yeah, where globally is the China-based company? Where where else does it have a presence globally that could give you different entry points through their filing systems? Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's useful. Now. All three of you, I'd love to know your answers to this because all three of you have got such expertise in getting documents, which is, you know, it, clearly it's 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 the path to great reporting in China. Well, or a lot of great reporting. I mean, it allows you to know things that uh, with a bit of effort, everyone could know, but most people don't know, have the tools or do the effort to, to find these, to find this information or to piece things together and then sound out the sources and, and create, well, tell stories and work things out. I'd love to hear from all three of you a bit about the platforms and tools that you use, and also um, uh, just uh, uh, the, the, the kinds of documents that, um, that you think um, you found uh, are most useful, you know, whether that's David talking about annual reports or is it uh, just stock market updates or, you know, what is it? Um, where, so firstly, Let's start with that. What are the documents? We'll go around each three of you. Where have you found your best stuff? Where should people be looking? Give, give us some give us some practical tips for where where people should be. Um, yeah, to, taking their eyes. Dave, let's. <laughs> sure, I can start. Um, wow, there are so many places. Um, but I should start by saying, I just collect everything and save it. Um, and so whether it's, if I'm doing a report, like all, I still have my old system, which is when I'm working on a story, I get a paper folder and I just stuff that thing with every kind of document. So not just a Google search, I will go through the Chinese corporate records. So China has corporate registration records you can get inside of China. There are Hong Kong registration records. There are, I will definitely check the, <clears throat> the SEC has even if the Chinese company is raising money um, to invest in China, there will be SEC documents uh, related to that. There are also UK companies house has private company documents. I will go to the ICIJ website or open corporates and see all of their corporate registration documents. Um, you may know that in the US, lots of journalists use um, TransUnion has a system where you can look at addresses in the US. And sometimes I'm looking at, for instance, when I covered H&A, the H&A um, executives are also living in the US. So I would use those US documents, even white pages, to see, can I match their homes um, to their names and understand who is in their network? 
So um, my folders are like every kind of document is possible, even transcripts of old interviews, right? Um, definitely Factiva. I will go through Factiva all the way to 1977. Um, many journalists think the last few years are very important. Um, I will go all the way to the beginning. Uh, I want to know the history of this company as far back as I can go. Um, I want to look up photographs of, of the people I'm, I'm looking for. Who did they appear? Go to their websites. Um, the news, the press releases, you would think press releases are like, throw them away, right? I would save all of those press releases because there are little details. In fact, we wrote about Ray Dalio the other day, uh, a couple of weeks ago in our magazine. And one of the findings we, we had about um, his partnership with this woman who was apparently related to a, a Politburo member, that was listed, her role was listed in a press release that Bridgewater, Dalio's company, put out in 1994. And that was still online. So I went and got that press release. So I would say there are my favorites, but I'm going to go everywhere. And yes. academic papers, annual reports, I'm going to read the fine prints. Um, I'm, I mean, my, my approach is just go crazy with every kind of document and then search in the backs of books for like, who did they talk to? What are their footnotes? Um, so I, I just like sort of maniacal research. And when you say, Dave, uh, folders, are, are you meaning physical folders with all this? Do you, do you I like used to. to um, yeah, I, I, I still do pretty much like to work with the physical folder because the problem is, yes, I can now put it in a Google Drive and it can all be there. But I like to mark up and lay it out. And I don't, I don't write any of my stories um, on a computer. I, I write everything by hand. I want to get away from the computer because I'm searching all day long. So I want to print out everything, see everything, see the photos, see the layouts of the stories. So I want a physical folder for every story, even though I can now do a Google Drive virtual folder. And that's great to save. It's great to search. If I'm going to search names and things, put it all in a digital folder. But once I get to the reading and writing, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm printing out many of those pages and um, in paging through them and thinking about the story and outlining by hand, not on the, not on the computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bao, Bao. Um, I can also add, I mean, people may not know that, I mean, but um, surprisingly, um, the Chinese government has a lot of documents about its uh, court verdicts and also yeah. uh, on the judiciary system, on uh, the Chinese government, you will be surprised by the volumes uh, of the verdicts and the details of the um, crimes that they have described, the penalties and the sentencing. So uh, of course, a lot of um, politically sensitive cases will not be, I mean, put in those into those contests, but there will be a lot of other stories. Like I, I remember I have um, did a, uh, an environmental investigation story on wildlife trafficking in China. So you will definitely um, be able to access to a lot of um, verdicts, uh, court cases or crimes related to um, criminal trafficking. And by those um, public information, you can basically draw a lot of conclusions on the scale and on the methods of, of those wildlife trafficking. And uh, I, I think like for those um, issues, which are more social and economically related, um, journalists would be able to get gather a lot of details and also information on those um, uh, on the website. Uh, but basically, you have to know how to read Chinese. And um, also in Hong Kong, I, I think like in Hong Kong, there are still some ways that we can access to data. Um, like take uh, an example, like for those Chinese company who are publicly listed uh, in Hong Kong still, there are any reports uh, on the um, stock exchange is still available and there, there are still a lot of things to knock into those reports, uh, like their um, subsidiaries companies, relations with other companies, um, loans and debts. There are still a lot to investigate into those um, behavior of companies, I think. And also there's still some 
search engine. I, I mean, which is uh, journalists have to subscribe that and it's quite expensive. That's the one, one stop um, search engine called Toven as a company. Um, so basically Toven is a company gather all information in one stop. So if you have a name, have a identity number, um, you can just type in the uh, information and then it will generate all public data that once appear in their government database. But I'm not mm. sure whether the government is going to crack down this kind of um, business because I mean, obviously they are violating the law, but I mean, they still exist and operating. So for those people who have doubts on accessing data to Hong Kong nowadays, or who have concerns over the security issue, they may try this kind of um, service um, that are available, but I will say at the same time, quite expensive. And I would also like to check just like a, what has said, just check globally everywhere. Like I remember the story I have done on Patrick Cole, I have to go to the PACER, I mean the US court system to look at the names of us and also maybe in Serbia. There are, I mean, there's like Chinese is global right now. So basically you have to figure out where are their footprints and just go to the country, see what kind of data that are available in that particular country and then just go to search the information that are available. So we try to piecing the puzzles together from everywhere. My idea is like um, China, the story of China is not just inside China, it's, it's always like everywhere. So mm -hmm. we could probably have more data than we thought. Now I just get, uh, so, so just to help all the listeners, that platform you said, TOFIN, is that T-O-F-I-N? Sorry, um, T-O-L-F-I-N. So uh, if you search um, yeah, TOLFIN, oh. T-O-L-F-I-N, and Target, you will probably, like, it's a, sing it's a Singaporean company. And it's a super expensive, yeah. I have to declare that, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. And, yeah, and um, is that something you think people will be able to, uh, will require, um, will they need to be taught how to use that? Or is that quite intuitive? Will, will people be able to just teach themselves. Um, it's very easy, but yeah. I mean, you have to pay me for yeah. subscription and then yeah. um, it will guarantee like a, a amount of time for you to assess. So basically it's, it's calculating the yeah. cost in seconds. After that amount of time you are guaranteed yeah. that you have to yeah. pay per second. Yeah. That's great. Um, now, and Jen, you know, you, you use a lot of, um, uh, well, you, you use like a number of different databases as well, but, but yeah, to tell us what, what, yeah, what are your sure. tips? Yeah, I think I'll go start and Annabelle have, um, you know, basically covered it all. Um, I, I use, um, you know, all of those um, tools that they yeah. mentioned as well. Maybe I'll just add, add two things more sort of from a methodology yeah. point of view. Um, I think first is that, um, as, as I'm sure many in the audience would um, know, I think there's like being, um, I think several third party um, um, providers in China that have got licenses to, um, you know, collect and uh, uh, present uh, the, 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 the Chinese corporate uh, records and, and as well as I think core filings and, and then things like that. And then they have all made like great apps, very user friendly, and all, and it's not even expensive at all. Um, you just take, you know, you, you need to subscribe to use it, but it's like totally affordable. Yeah. Um, and that is definitely great, as in that it definitely democratizes um, the access to public information in China. However, I think that that also means that you know it's very difficult to have say any sort of edge when it comes to accessing public data because you know it, it's actually very easy to use on um, all these tools um and um i think what i would you know a piece of advice from you know my personal um experiences is that um i would i would only use those um you know databases by the way um is i'm talking about you know platforms like tian yan cha or qi cha cha or qi xing bao etc so I, I i usually only use them for scoping so you know i i will key in a person's name and see what are the you know, companies you know, the, that this person has um you know directorship or 
uh, 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 or house management roles. However, whenever I decide that I'm going to take it to the next step and um, use some of that findings in my reporting, I will always, always go back to cross check um, that um, in the original um, um, government databases, which are like scattered um, provincially, those databases are definitely a pain to uh, navigate. But I think um, we have to be, to have have sort of you know um, uh, we have to be uh, uh, you know uh, um, method uh, methodological when it comes to um, reporting information like that. Because there's been I think occasional cases where um, you know, some of these third-party data providers do not have their records up to date, and then you know, um, leading to mistakes in reporting. Sometimes it could be very uh, consequential um, um, uh, things happen to you know the companies or the people you're covering. Um, and then the uh, second um, thing I want to add is um, don't forget about the good old you know getting internal documents. Um, I was I wouldn't be able to to do locking coffee investigation without first having gigabytes of the company's internal documents and that's where I started. Um, I mean I'm not that's not to say that this is easy. It's definitely not an easy thing to get. But I think the most powerful investigation always comes from a combination of both internal, you know, uh, uh, i.e., private, <clears throat> excuse me, and yeah. and like on um, documents. Yeah. And then I'll just just to clarify those um those platforms that you um that you were recommending there, which you later cross check against. What's the kind of information that you're that you're pulling up using those? Um. So for example, um, again using Locking Coffee as an example, um, yeah. <clears throat> there is um for example the chairman of the company, and I want to see what are the other companies um that are registered in China under his name, and then. Yeah. I'll, I'll just key in his name in any of these apps that I just mentioned, and then you'll see yeah. a number yeah. of results. But first is that these results do not eliminate, you know, people with the same names. So you have yeah. to yeah. go through them and, you know, basically use other, you know, circumstantial evidences to tell if this is actually a, a, the same person and if this company is related, right? And then second is that, um, because the, the the government database itself does not only allow search by company names, not by people's names. So that's why these um, third-party apps actually a very good place to start with to scope. And then once you you know say for example zeroed in on ten companies, and then you want to verify further on um, you know what you've seen, then you can then go back to the uh, government databases searching by names. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I see. Um, now we've got, uh, I'm going to um, weave in some questions that we're getting from the audience. There's lots of good questions and they're bouncing off a lot of things um, that we've been talking about. One was, uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit because I took a quick note of it, but essentially, can you trust the numbers that you're reading that are released um, by the, uh, by a Chinese company about its, uh, about its uh the company's performance. Um, yeah, people people asking about this is a skepticism around uh, around numbers that might be filed in a Chinese in Chinese corporate records. I can jump in and okay. say um, I'm always skeptical of the financials, um, and you yeah. should be. I mean, you could even be skeptical not just in China but other places about the financials, but. They're the official reported numbers, and there are accounting firms. And so, you know, you weigh of, you know, just like this is a government case, you say, well, this is the official filing, this is what they say. But of course, what Jing did is, is to try to look into those numbers and to always be a little skeptical as a journalist. And she could track down, figure out a way to, to, to determine, do I believe those numbers? I think what she was mentioning earlier and what I was mentioning, um, we've all mentioned is the corporate records that generally we're looking at are showing ownership records and relationships and networks. Those, I, doesn't mean they're always right, but I tend to think those are generally right. Um, there could be cases where they remove things, but um, again, these are the official government records of who owns a company. 
And so yeah. it's in their name. It, they may not, they may have a side agreement. And I think we should all in looking at the records recognize that um, there could be a side agreement, um, but it is legal that they are the legal owner of those shares. And what also, we didn't talk about this, but in a lot of the records that I've looked at, I'm sure Jing too, is a lot of people you find, you don't actually know who those people are. There's no clear, there's not an ID number, there's not a definite, you might not find any bio about that person. It could be what they call a white glove um, or a, a relative that is holding those shares. There's also, as I, I um, shared with some in our group, some of the layered structure of Chinese companies. So to figure out who really owns that share, you have to go through lots of companies. So there's a lot of complexity around the records. You should always be skeptical of any records going through, trying to figure out, um, can I call this person? Is there another record that backs up this record? So all of the regular reporting you know, methods and cautions you should take. And in the end, I want to call up these people and say, is this really you? Give them a chance to say no, or you've got the wrong person. But they're a great starting point. They're a way for you to have leverage in going into those interviews and meetings and say, these records show, these things tell me that they're wrong. Um, so the records are not, especially in China, it's not the end. Um, but it's a, it's a great lead in for your story. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Anyone um, else on that? Can I also add, like, um, like if those Chinese listed companies are listed in Hong Kong, um, if you want really want to look into the corporate governance or whether the finance is truthful, you will be surprised that sometimes you can look into the auditing report because like the auditors, they will declare whether they are they 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 have the due diligence like uh, responsibility. So um, sometimes they will declare that they didn't think their auditing works well in that company. So for those companies who have problems or who have issues, there are also, um, always some black facts. One of the wet flags is the auditors, they have disagree opinions. So you will be surprising to see that there are some auditing reports uh, illustrating that the auditors companies have um, disagreeing opinions. And you can also see like um, from the enterprise, from the auditors that they have employed, like whether they are the top four auditors, the big four auditors, or they are some second tier or even third tier auditors that could also give you a sense of whether like that report is trustworthy. But again, that's only the beginning of like uh, being skeptical on a particular company. I, I remember like there's a lot of financial uh, journalists, they are doing uh, frauds, I mean, on investigating frauds on Chinese enterprise. And what they do is like the real job of auditors. In the past, when they can go to China, when they find a business that could, could too good to be true, they will go to the field by themselves to look at the operations of the, of the companies to see whether like their declarations and the reports are true. So, I mean, that those reports are the first step and still journalists have to use their own ways to verify the, those, those data inside. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I wanted to add that the restrictions on journalists and even the crackdown on um, investigators in China, say you were working for an investment firm and trying to investigate companies you invested in to see whether they actually had factories or operations. That's yeah. going to make things much more, I think, also the crackdown on the Chinese media, which is a great source for the non-Chinese media, is going to make it difficult for us to have, you know, before there was just so much diversity and layers that things would yeah. leak out. Um, it's, this, is, this is going to be a big challenge. If I'm investing in Chinese companies now, um, if I were, it would be a lot more difficult to trust the numbers and have fewer watchdogs, fewer, you know, um, uh, less of an ability to get in and check out that company. Um, mm -hmm. I think what Jing did with Luckin, it'd be a lot harder today than even like a year ago, right? Yeah. And Jin, Jin I'm it's so fascinated on that, just on the fast changing media dynamic, especially covering corporate stories. And, and there's a great point there from Dave that 
the Chinese media and and uh, particularly in, in recent decades has been a source of so much great reporting that international media could surf across or pick apart and push forward. I wonder how much are you do you find yourself following Chinese media leads less than you were, say, a year ago or two years ago or five years ago or, or, is, or not, just as much because it's tighter than others? I'm interested. How's your, the relationship of your reporting to Chinese media at the moment? Uh, maybe I'll start. Um, I think first is that the Chinese media landscape has also got a pretty, you know, dynamic and complex. Um, it requires actually, I think, a higher level of media literacy to be able to tell um, what are, you know, truly sort of, you know, uninfluenced, you know, independent stories and what are stories that are planted by, you know, whatever party that has the vested interest in the story itself. So I'll, you know, I think, you know, that's definitely a challenge even to, um, you know, someone who speaks native Chinese like me. Um, and then, in terms of taking the leads, I think I, I mostly use um, Chinese media and social media included first, uh, you know, as a barometer of, you know, sentiment on a particular issue in China. Yeah. Um, and um, that is very helpful, especially, you know, when you can't really meet people from there, right? Um, yeah. And then, yeah. and then secondly, you know, also, um, you know, maybe, sort of incremental things because they follow things definitely much more closely than we do. Um, so I also try to keep up with, you know, um, what they've been covering. Um, and then that's uh, that has been helpful too. I, I would just say that, you know, um, in the last two years, I would say, you know, looking at what's going on in the social media, media landscape has become more important, um, you know, because of, you know, either physical or whatever restrictions that we are facing um, that, mm -hmm. you know, make us hard to actually talk to people on the ground. Yeah. Um, now, a question that came through, and I, I've been wondering it too, oh, this was on reporting on China from outside of China. And we've spoken a lot, and it's great that we've spoken a lot about many opportunities that reporters have to do terrific reporting covering China and the world. But a big limitation that someone's asked about is, what do you do about you, you can get access to a lot of these documents online and you can find also you can piece things together you can trace them into whether those documents are lodged within the Chinese system or in other countries around the world but when it's coming to off the record but really important conversations background conversations to confirm that you're or to test out your idea of something I'm really that that seems to be something that in certain instances, it must be far more complicated. And I wonder if in certain instances makes certain reporting just not possible. And Dave, I wanted to start with you on this. I was rereading your amazing piece on Wen Jiabao's family and the, the super wealth that you trace back to that, um, that you got the Pulitzer for and you got the New York Times, I think, banned in China in 2013 for a, amazing mm. reporting from you know, the old golden age of reporting before the new one. <laughs> but I wondered actually, as I read through that um, last night, just um, thinking about this, could you do that story today? Would you be able to, I, it seems to me you could probably get all the documents that you got with painstaking research, but some mm -hmm. of those views you did that confirmed things or made you feel comfortable to publish it the way you did, what do you think? Would you be able to do that, publish that story as it was today? Um, yes and no, and I'll explain. Um, yeah. The no part is when I did that, worked on that story in 2011 and 12, um, unlike today where they're talking about all these apps and websites where you can get corporate records digitally, really of the last three to five years, when I started that in 2011, we got the paper records. Um, and so I could request Ping An's records and then pay $50 and a, a week later or two weeks later, a thousand pages of every uh, shareholding change written in Chinese, stamped um, with the ID cards of the people in there. 
which I did think at the time we were suspicious when we saw those, like, is that real? Why would they release those? But at that time, they were very loose and law firms and consulting firms would give you the full record. So there were ID cards that would help place, um, for instance, it would show me these two people are from Tianjin. Uh, I know their ages. So I could do certain things to identify family members that I could not do today. Um, and also we could go to cemeteries, which I could not do from outside of China. So there were lots of techniques that would either extend the time or make it nearly impossible to do parts of it. Um, on the other hand, um, I did not make a single call um, on that story for about 10 months or 11 months. There were no sources that talked to me and gave me things. It started out as completely documents on a hunch, using records from Hong Kong, from China, looking at those original records. And the strategy was don't tell anyone we're doing this story and don't call people and don't give them a tip. So when I did interview people, they were more like accountants or lawyers and saying, how do corporate records work? Does this make sense to you? But not, I'm doing a story on the prime minister of China. I would not tell them that. <laughs> so um, there were large parts that I could do today, might take a little bit longer. There were a couple of areas that I would not be able to get, um, but there actually were so, this was probably in my career, the only story that I got to the finish line and had not done more than three on the record interviews. After a year and a half, three interviews, it was all documents. But then in the final days, we called everyone. You know, we called the state council, we called Wen Jiabao's family, we called, you know, everyone in their mobile phones. So I did lots of those interviews in Japan at the end of that story. And so that was when the real calling happened. Um, and to answer your earlier question, it is a big barrier that I cannot meet Chinese in China, in Beijing. I would travel around and believe it or not, up until I left, people would tell me amazing things in person at restaurants. There wasn't surveillance everywhere. I couldn't believe what I was being told in, in many of those interviews. How could I do that today? If I'm lucky, Chinese travel outside of China, I meet them in New York or Boston or San Francisco or somewhere or Hong Kong before. Yeah. But now using sources, very, very difficult. Once in a while still, I get people inside China who are leaking me documents, sending them outside. So it still happens and it will always happen but it's much harder to get that that face to face developing the sources that help you figure out stories i think that i that's meeting those people including businessmen in china who will admit that they're bribing officials that's not the same as meeting a scholar or an expert who spent yeah. time in china and really knows it so unfortunately I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to do that part. So I need to focus on what I can do outside to get the China story from a different angle. Yeah. Um, and on that same um, that same subject, um, Jen, I'll ask first, because I wonder now based in Hong Kong, you've got to negotiate that problem all the time, right? Um, that, that's not something that's a, a new development. But I wonder, how do you go about that? And do you? Uh, are you able to use the journal's uh, broader team so, you, you know, you can work with your colleagues who are based in the mainland to get around some of those problems or, yeah? Mm, sure, yeah. I think uh, we used to have a very big team based in uh, mainland China, <laughs> as, as you know. Um, and then now, sorry, we're we're left with, now we're left with just a fraction of that. So, um, yes. and I think that, that happened. The expulsion happened also around the time I was investigating and locking, so that really wasn't an option. Um, yeah. But in normal times, yes, um, you know, um, I I would be able to. Um, I'm leaning on you know my colleagues on the ground. Um, but I think increasingly less so. Um, for the reasons that I, that I 
I talked about, we, we, we still do a lot of like cross bureau, cross border collaborations. Um, but, you know, I would say, you know, we are now covering China from 24 seven. Um, as a result of that, you know, we, 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 we had a rethink of how to cover China. And now we have um, China specialists based um, in all the time zones. Um, and so that is definitely great. Um, um, and then, and then in terms of, you know, doing stories, I, I will, I will probably say that maybe business and financial inv investigations are just relatively an easier area um, to, to, to cover and to investigate uh, from remotely, um, you know, because of, you know, internet, because, you know, I think nowadays, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on Bell and David, but I think the documents, the publicly available documents you can get out of China are, you know, most of them are digitized and it can be, can be, can, can be gotten online, um, you know, no ID cards anymore um, because, you know, cracked on on the copper um, um, registration database. Um, but, you know, that said, there are still, you know, useful tidbits. And by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, I think, you know, where we talk about like ownership records, relationships, and, you know, don't forget small things such as register the addresses, phone numbers, email addresses. And that this goes with all the records, you know, not just in mainland China and all the jurisdictions. Th those can also often um, offer you clues as well. Now I see we're um, we're getting close to the end. Um, unfortunately, we've got I haven't got through anywhere near all the audience questions. I'm sorry to anyone who's asked a question and I didn't get to it. Um, I really am. I promise I didn't get to ask all my questions either. So <laughs> we're in the same position. That happens with such a great panel um so look, i'll let you all say something before we before we wrap up uh, if you like there was i saw one question here which was a, a biggie what do you think is the most important investigative subject on china um <laughs> you, you could you could leave with your thoughts on that or, or maybe just some just some final thoughts on on the topic and val let's go to you first i mean like I am super interested to look at how China impacts in globally. And I also think that will give up more opportunities to look at China and like the Bell and Road Initiative. Um, China is having great influence in every countries. Like they have the biggest peace cable project in Pakistan. I, I think no one is going deep into that. How does it impact their digital security, how does it impact um, the relations between Pakistan and also um, China and also um, the cables can go um, can touch Africa. I mean, there are so many things happening globally and that's offers a lot of opportunities also for cross-border collaborations and which um, help us to go through the constraints that we are now have in China and have in Hong Kong. So I, I will try to like um, put China in a more global context, um, basically because of that's really a big story. And secondly, and it also allows us to have more chances to cover on China. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, uh, Dave. Yeah, I want to echo that and say China goes global is the most interesting story, not only because it's gonna be the world's largest economy pretty clearly, um, and its impact, we, we just couldn't imagine, I would say even six years ago, that it would happen so fast, that we went from, well, China can't create any original companies to, wow, the TikTok <laughs> can, can outmaneuver Facebook, and China is, on the rise in so many different industries with electric vehicles, et cetera. So I think that story of China globalizing, and I think that's a relatively new story that, and it, it's also so interesting because it's complex. It's not, it's not a China is bad story or China is a good story. It's, it's yeah. how does China fit into the world and whether it's climate change or all the other issues of Chinese businessmen going abroad um, or China trying to acquire technology or the rivalry with the US. 
there's just way more stories than, you know, I, I pick up the journal of the times and I'm like, wow, there are five stories a day on China. When I was there for much of my time in China, it was like one China story a day or two China stories a day. Today, literally, it can be every day. China is the story. Yeah, uh, exciting, exhausting, I find as well, but exciting, mostly exciting. <laughs> oh, wait, well, it's good news for us, right? We're in demand um, as you're all yeah, in China. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say maybe for me, um, you know, one of the most interesting things to watch um, and to cover on the next, uh, you know, in the, in the foreseeable future is that whether there is, you know, you know, economic and financial decoupling um, going on between China and the U.S. and China and the rest of the world. Um, and 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 I I think there are many many stories to tell. Whether it is decoupling or it is actually not, it's just you know hitting a pause. And um, that's going to be um, mm. what I find the most interesting. Yeah. 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 Well. I think I've got to wrap it up um, so we don't get pinged or just taken off air or whatever happens if we run out of time. <laughs> we, I don't want to find out what happens with that. So um, thank you so much to all three of you. It's been such a pleasure for me. I feel very spoiled I got to ask all these questions of you. I've learned so much. I'm sure people back, uh, people listening have as well. I know they have. I know they have. Um, thank you for being so generous. I mean, you're helping other people try to do the clever things that you all do, but I... You three are all such superstars. I don't think you need to worry. We're going to cut your grass. Or <laughs> so I, I'm very, I, I'm, you've just been so generous with your tips. I, I really, really appreciate that. And I'm so happy we spoke at length about reporting on China today, albeit noting all sorts of hurdles and things, but with a lot of promise. You know, there is a lot of exciting journalism to be done in, the, I mean, in this space. It's daunting at times. It's incredible how much, I mean, Dave's saying that, the, and it's spot on, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal just have more and more China. Oh, my God, in Australia, you, <laughs> a newspaper is almost just a China, you know, from the front page through the business, through sports, through arts. It's everywhere. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So um, our listeners all around the world, I'm sure, are experiencing that wherever they're based. And, um, yeah, yeah, I, looking forward to reading all their wonderful reporting, following on all your wonderful advice. So thanks again, Dave, Jen and Bao. It's been wonderful to um, speak to you all.